Yeah, you know? I do support the master transit plan, okay. uh, but I also want to put in, uh, I want to do a rail relocation study to understand whether we should be actually considering other options. Uh, light rail transit's been used in Calgary. Uh, it's been put in place replacing BRT in Ottawa. Uh, I want to un understand the full costs. And I know the federal government was interested when I was the MP, but they were looking for, uh, they were interested in studying this, but only if there was civic leadership to say yes. And so I'm interested in making sure that we actually have uh, do that study so we can have all the numbers on the table and then we can actually make an appropriate decision. Because I think we can keep getting held up by saying debates around, you know, whether we do this or do that. And sometimes you actually don't need to build whole new roads for buses. There are already roads on our streets and other jurisdictions make a diamond lane and it's a dedicated lane for the buses and taxis so people can get around efficiently across the city. And we should actually be doing that in the city of Winnipeg. It's to encourage people to get out of their cars because the buses are safe, they're affordable, they're convenient, and they're clean. And they're a good experience. Um, when I lived in Quebec City, even when I was in the military, I used to ride my bike most places, uh, even though I had a car. And when I was actually going to the university for my evening courses, I would get on the bus, read my newspaper, study my course notes, get to the university because parking was expensive, get back in my car or got back in the bus to go home and it was like a couple dollars and it was, you know, I was relaxed when I got home. It was actually a good experience. A whole bunch of things. Uh, one, I've got, a very, I've got two very detailed transit things. I have a transit safety plan that, talk, that does everything from on-bus safety systems to the ridiculous situation right now, especially since we have a radio system that doesn't cover the bus when it goes in certain parts of the city. Let, let let transit operators, drivers call 911. I mean, you've got someone who's violent with a weapon on the bus, which is often, which has been too often the case where we've actually had drivers, a driver killed and others threatened and having to crawl through windows on the buses to get out. Call 911. We have police officers all along these routes. We start to assign responsibility for those buses. So if you're at, you know, uh, if you're at uh, Maine and Graham on a bus, there's, you know, the, the local police, con if we have to go back to beat cops, uh, the local police constables in that area can be available. They are like that. I mean, they can jump on the bus. We can have intermediary folks who are ready to go onto buses in those situations. Um, the bus shelter, the, uh, the bus shields, pieces are really important. Um, but just getting, I mean, there's a 10 point plan there for transit safety that was endorsed by the Amalgamated Transit Union. I worked with Functional Transit on it. Absolutely. Um, the rapid transit and the electrified complete bus thing is the transit master plan. Um, the, the, that's what we're doing. And we go further. We say that it should be uh, 10 minute uh, ahead times, which is guessed down to about a five minute um, wait time on all 13 major routes, which is a stronger commitment than I think any other candidate has made. And one of the reasons is because as soon as you have that, you take the you take the, the schedule and you tear it up. You don't need a schedule anymore. You don't need an app anymore. Um, you know if the bus is coming every five minutes, you can just reasonably walk to, to, to the, your bus stop uh, and do that. The, the, there's two modifications that I would look at. Uh, for the master plan. And I talked to people who were involved in functional transit. They don't have any problem. In fact, they like this. Uh, one is where we can put more separated on-road bus rapid transit lines immediately. Um, we should do that to get the increased uh, speed and to get the increased frequency we need. Uh, the other thing is I go back to the, the sort of this idea of value uplift. You know, if you keep designing rapid transit corridors the way that we have on the one that goes down to the through past the university without proper residential development, without it being the spine of walkable residential neighborhoods, you, you, you have a lot of cost and you're not building the tax base very much. Um, so where, how these lines are located, um, how they're designed uh, to look like, how walkable and how many people can live in close proximity to them, um, and that they actually get to all the major destination or uh, origins and destinations that are really critical for large amounts of ridership, you're going to end up with a very expensive system. You're going to be build, build, building a lot of roads and rapid transit ways to nowhere. Um, so I, uh, we're going to take that. So we're going to model out each one of these rapid transit lines to look at how do we maximize the uplift in uh, in value. So we're building the tax base much more aggressively along these lines. Okay. I wanted to just clarify the, the one statement that you said when you were talking about safety, 
-hmm. You're not talking about having police officers assigned onto buses. You're talking about if there is a conflict, there is a, a, a better Rapid way for response. an immediate response. Okay. You get a number one, one call that. Yeah. No, I don't think I don't. I, I think it would create a very unpleasant dynamic, and I've heard really clearly that people do not want that. And you know, th th this is all on a precondition of very extensive community involvement and participation in deciding any transit safety policy. Um, you know, I've. It, it is not something that we're going to do unilaterally. It is something that these safety solutions have to be put before riderships, before communities, um, and get consent from people to proceed with these. You know, I don't want to advance a solution, uh, even though it may be a great safety solution that creates a very alienating or threatening situation for a lot of people in our community who would, who would feel very uncomfortable on a bus uh, with uh, police officers regularly riding them or security officers. It, City of Winnipeg, we have actually the worst transit system in the nation, okay, in spite of whatever awards they might give themselves. And I know that because, again, I have been to other places, right? And it doesn't make any sense to me that we have the greatest bus manufacturer in the world in Winnipeg and we have the world's worst transit system. There are three things, three very specific things that I have already announced relative to transit. One is safety, okay? I am, I am going to have the Winnipeg Police Service create a unit of dedicated transit police who will understand that the that the, the job of providing public safety everywhere in the city includes the inside of a transit bus. I do not believe in more, you know, citizen community oversight committees, okay? I want the cops to do their job. Second thing is I'm committed to replacing the 40-year-old radio systems that, that the drivers need for communication so that they can feel safe. It is totally unacceptable that we have City of Winnipeg employees who show up at work every day and don't know if they're going to get stabbed on the job. And by the way, our transit operators are the worst paid in the country. Okay, they're among the people that need that need to that need to see their pay increased. So transit safety is a really, really big and important thing for me. And as far as improving the services go, we need more buses more often, more frequently on roads that we already have. And that includes access, reliable transit to our industrial parks where our Winnipeg's largest employers are. I visited an employer this summer. They have 600 staff members and they run a 24 hour factory. The bus stop in front of their shop, the bus is the closest bus stop, the next one is, you know, miles away, is runs three buses a day. There's one at six in the morning, one at seven in the morning, and one at three in the afternoon. None of their employees can take the bus to work reliably. And what that means for them is that they have the as a company, they have tremendous problems with recruitment because you can only work there if you have a car. But you know what else that means? That means that, the, that for the individuals in the city that might want to have a nice job, and they're desperate, they're desperate for employees, right? And they're, they're a good pay, paying, paying employer in this city. They've been in business for 90 years. And for people who don't have a car in Winnipeg, those jobs are simply not available to them. So, you know, transit to work and making sure that we are providing transit so that people can get to Winnipeg's largest employers is a really important piece of my plan too. Transit police officers, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. It's a quick one. Are you talking within existing resources or are you talking about giving them more? I am going to get rid of all of the fare inspectors that currently exist within the, Win uh, the Winnipeg transit system. I'm going to take that money plus a little bit more to add a dedicated $1 million a year to the Winnipeg police budget to ensure that there are dedicated transit officers. Yes, I support the Winnipeg transit master plan. I have made a vow that to complete the entire plan by 2030. And my first priority is the uh, creation of a frequency, uh, fr more frequency within the transit system. It was, yeah, I was very proud to, to help develop, you know, with, with many others, the transit master plan. It was, a, it, was a community, it was a community project, it really was. It's a very good plan, and now we need to implement the plan. So I'm committed to taking the steps towards implementing the transit master plan. We have to have a modern transit service. Uh, that is more frequent, more reliable um, for for people to build a modern city. So I'm I'm certainly you know I'm committed to seeing that master plan implemented. One of my commitments and and one of you know the investments that the tax increases will fund is to add 11 new buses per year over the next few years uh, to, to over the next three years. Pardon me to make sure we have more buses available for more frequent uh, frequency. Because of COVID, we are still running at uh, you know a 94% service level. We're not at 100%. I've committed that next year, as mayor, we would go back to 100% service level. 
Um, I know our ridership is still below what it was before mm -hmm. we, you know, the, the, the pandemic hit, but by providing 100% service level, we'll provide more reliability, more service for more individuals, um, which makes the bus more, you know, uh, uh, more of an option for people. We also have to address safety on buses. I'm committed to doing that. Again, if we can assist individuals right now that are in transit shelters, that would help. I know that our operators right now are, are, are not, you know, they, they don't enforce fares. Um, to try to avoid that conflict is one of the reasons. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm committed to having our, our operators though also have full shields on, on the buses as well for their own driver safety. In, um, in my commitments, I also talked about the need to provide transit to some of the newer uh, areas of the city as well. So an on-demand service up in the Maples area is a commitment I've made. If we can get more and more people onto the bus and out of their vehicles, you know, that, that transportation mode shift is, is important. And so those are commitments I've made uh, as well. That's good. Cool. Thank you very much for that question. I support uh, the master plan as well, transit plan. But one thing I want to improve on is uh, safety. Because you can have a plan. But if it's not safe for people, then it's going to be a bit challenging, right? You just spend the money. So part of my plan is to collaborate, you know, with the police and ensure, you know, we have more foot patrol, you know, around the transit, like maybe shelter, some areas that are prone to violence. And then um, another thing is to just keep track and make sure that, you know, we can improve on safety. But I support the plan, but we need to improve on safety as well. Specifically, like, are you thinking like driver safety or passenger safety? Both, you know, obviously it's not a, it's not a choice, but so, but you believe in like in that policing would add more policing would, would be, would help resolve the issue? No, we are not going to add more policing right now. So um, my plan is the safety of the passenger and the operators. I'm not planning to put any police in the bus, no. <laughs> So but what I'm trying to say is we are going to have uh, more police presence in some areas. This is based on statistics on some areas that are prone to violence and assault, right? So that at least they can keep an eye in that particular neighborhood. And people will, you know, understand that, you know what, we just have to, you know, support the police and the police too will be able to, you know, help the people as well. But we are still going to use the existing resources. If you look at my plan right now, I'm not planning to spend a lot of money but we just want to use the existing resources we have, right? And spend the money judiciously. This is taxpayer money. We can't spend it anyhow. So I do agree with the master plan. I don't believe it should take, I think it's 45 years to implement. I think you have a federal government who's actively trying to uh, support active transit. So let's utilize once we have a cooperative government, which may not always be here. Uh, I think uh, it's an aggressive approach when it comes to transit. So we need to minimize that time. Going back to our carbon um, you know, sustainability, climate change component. Uh, it's a massive, uh, very important component of that as well. Um, yes, I believe in it. No, I don't believe in the time. I think we need to force it, um, not force it, but really engage in ensuring that it's um, uh, completed as fast as possible. Um, what I do want to see, what I would change is that last leg of BRT uh, uh, being kind of changed to LRT. I think uh, I really have this vision of LRT being all the way down Portage Avenue uh, to the very end of Portage Avenue because that may actually help with our commuter issues. I think that we can negotiate and we can um, work together with surrounding communities to have like park and rides outside of the city and people can get on LRT and get to where they want to go. I think it's a wonderful plan. Um, 25 year implementation is crazy. We've suggested we sh we we should aim to do it in 10, beginning with um, moving as quickly as possible. Councillor Allard, I think, had a good suggestion that let's get going on it as soon as we can with straightening out some of the, the key routes. And, and we've suggested multiple ways of paying for the city's share of accelerating the implementation plan, uh, including dedicating transit-oriented development property tax revenues to um, 
to transit because good rapid transit should actually raise property tax revenues from the developments in and around. So other cities are doing that. And I think that's something that that's pretty important. We would like to make one, have discussions around making one significant change. The city's planning on purchasing 133 diesel buses and and also they're they're studying transit on demand and we we think that some cities our size are using electric vans wheelchair accessible electric vans which can be summoned to your house and having them uh, either whisk you to a regional location or out to the rapid transit stop and we just think having vans do what they do well which is being very flexible and picking up a small number of people in a very quick manner and taking them out to where buses do what they do well which is taking a lot of people to uh you know one particular spot and having those buses arriving uh, frequently and um and and so combining those two things together would be an important I would argue innovation, a friendly amendment to that what is otherwise an amazing, amazing plan, the transit master strategy. As far as low income goes. Yeah, uh, the, the master transit plan is again, another really great plan that uh, it's a very big plan and very detailed plan. Um, I was at a, I was at a, um, a speaking engagement a couple of days ago where uh, listening to the folks from Functional Transit and you know one thing I constantly hear about that is, is that um, there is a part of this plan that is is very specific and then there's a second part that is quite vague. Uh, I think that when I when I look at that plan one of the things that I've said even today actually I, I, um, I had said this is that the frequent service part of that needs to be prioritized and we need to push that up right now. We need to figure out how to, how to build out this frequent uh, network plan because it, doesn't, it's, it, it can't just be a simple flick of the switch. Like it will take some time to roll out. Uh, you need to look at signage and you need to look at turnarounds. And so there's a lot of factors that need to be looked at. But right now, we don't have that we don't have that funding estimated to come in until about 2025 so or 2024 2025 so if it, if that's the case and then it takes a couple more years we're not going to actually see this until closer to the end of the decade rather than now and uh, so i would like to see that part fast tracked i tried to stop and for people who are of any income but lower income who use the bus more uh, that in itself is going to be really helpful. Uh, I take the bus sometimes to work, and when I do, uh, I've, actually, I've actually timed this in different ways. It's a 12-minute drive, it's a 25-minute bike ride, it's a 50-minute run, and it is a 45-minute bus ride, right? And so when we look at changing the system, we can also make the, uh, the buses a lot more faster and efficient. They get you to where you want to go faster. In the north end here, buses that pass my store, they don't, they come like every hour and a half sometimes during the day. So it's like, you know, this access is a part of our city that is, is generally lower income. So having more access to frequent bus services, it's, uh, it's a really important thing. Uh, I think the buses need to be clean. Like particularly when I ride them in the wintertime, I notice that the buses are really, really dirty. And so that, that in itself, it gives us this perception of uh, not being safe or not being convenient, not being comfortable. And uh, I, the buses sometimes are just not clean for days. The seats are full of uh, all kinds of stuff. When I ride the bus, it's in the morning. So you kind of ask, ask, have to ask yourself, like if it's the first thing in the morning and the bus is still not being clean, like nobody's even back in the seats. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a bit of an awkward situation. So uh, I think that's, uh, you know, really important too. Buses need to be safe. Um, you know, that's a really big, uh, really big topic right now. And um, you know, drivers, I think there, there needs to be driver safety as well. But, uh, but people who ride the bus, if a lot of people are saying now, they're still afraid to ride the bus. They're afraid to, you know, they're afraid to stand at the shelters. They're afraid to ride the bus. And so we do need to work and find ways to, to make that more safe 
Uh, I don't particularly think, think that putting uh, police on the bus is the right way to go. So I would disagree with any of the other candidates who say that. Um, but I do think that having, inter having tra more transit inspectors who inspect, you know, fares and those kinds of things I think can be quite helpful.